let's see. I think we are about to go live. Stream, stream health is yellow. You are live. Hey, <laughs> hey. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Sabaho. Welcome back to the channel. Um, yeah, <laughs> we're gonna start off. Uh, happy Saturday. Happy April eleventh, twenty twenty. And uh, with that, we'll start with a sip of water. And um, yeah. Yeah, let's uh, let's give a few minutes for people to start joining in. Sabaho, Sabaho Bakri, Sabah Lakhir, Ahlan, Ahlan, KSJV. <laughs> Hi, good morning, guys. Uh, let me let me get the actual uh, pop out chat. Yeah, here we are. Because every time we do this, it just works out a lot better. Here we are. Hirard, uh, Ahlan, Ahlan. Hi, man. Hey, man. Good morning. Good morning. Ahlan thought it Majid. Good morning, Sabaho. Hey everybody, Steve L, uh, Firebug. Oh man, uh, so Firebug, that's Arabic. It, they're they're just saying good morning. They're uh, it's the uh, the standard caption for the for the for the channel. Sawaho is good morning in Arabic, and uh, they're just saying good morning as they're joining the chat. So uh, welcome to the welcome to the chat. Uh, Bakri, I did see your message, and I'm I'm thinking about it, and I'll, I'll try to get back to you hopefully today, inshallah. Uh, do me a favor though, uh, if you're on uh, on Instagram and you do actually uh, you follow me on Instagram, hit me up on Instagram so that I can check out the profile and then we can talk from there. It'll be a little bit easier than Twitter. Uh, ben, oh yeah, good afternoon, Ben. Yeah, obviously, you know, depending on where you are in the uh, in the world, uh, this may be morning, afternoon, or evening, depending again where you are. Uh, but generally, it's just it's just the way I open up the channel. It's just sabaho is um, something that I grew up with that means just basically hello, good morning. Yeah, a lot of people will say it even if they're in the afternoon, uh, but it's more of a greeting kind of a way. So yeah, it works really, really good. Um, as everybody's coming in here, I, I definitely want to say welcome. Uh, make sure you guys are obviously, you know, staying at home, staying safe. Uh, hey, uh, Manish from India. <laughs> hey, buddy. Uh, First, so um, Arshan was asking, what's my name? I said, my name is Tariq Bey, so T-A-R-E-K. That's the name that I have on the Arabic channel, but the English channel is just TK. It's easier. Um, also, I find that a lot of people remember TK a lot easier than they are. They would remember Tariq, mostly because they try to read it, uh, and, and that's just something. Oh, yeah, Boston's already in the afternoon. Well, uh, you know, coast to coast. Let's keep it that way, you know, both sides of the country. Uh, so yeah, West Coast, it's uh, roughly 9.52. It's still kind of in the morning turning into that whole brunch timeline, you know, if you if you have brunch. Um, it is Saturday the 11th, and this week in tech, we had a few things going on, obviously. And what I want to do today, obviously, we're going to talk a little bit more about the OnePlus um, leaks as we saw more information being coming out, especially from OnePlus. I think OnePlus is starting to embrace how the tech community and the enthusiast community that follow them love having more information. And they're basically just basically dropping information every once in a while. So we saw some more information from them. Um, obviously, we know that this, there is going to be a wireless charger supporting for the new uh, OnePlus 8 line series of devices. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be on both devices, if they're going to do it on both the Pro and the and the standard model, mostly because, again, a lot of the information we're getting right now are leaked. Uh, and in the actual, uh, at least in the teaser that we saw, we saw some design cues, and I'll show you guys a little bit more about that in the art in the articles. Um, I appreciate it, Majid. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mariha is in here. Uh, Bakri is in here. Hirard, um, Arshan, uh, <laughs> again, uh, Muhammad, Ahlan, uh, Ahlan brother <laughs> Alan. and um so but yeah the the main goal this week again we're going to recap a little bit more what's going on uh i pushed out three videos on the channel but not all on the channel i've had obviously videos on the arabic channel and, and videos on the english channel as well as i did a live stream on amazon which i also I actually covered something that is a little bit different than what i generally cover and that's uh building a uh basically kind of like a, a rate setup with external drives to connect to our pc but the RAID controller in the enclosure includes a smart hub that enables you to actually use that actual enclosure. It's almost like a dock with a one cable connection to a PC that supports 60 watt charging. And of course, be able to connect to a 4K monitor, connect to USB keyboard, bounce. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but the way we're going to, we're, we'll, we'll go ahead and approach it is um, I want to make sure I say good morning again, everybody. Welcome back. And let me just double check and make sure that the tweet did go out. I hope it did. <laughs> Last time I did that, I wasn't sure. Yes, so Colin, Colin, everybody else was on there, uh, and then we're going to start off by just looking a little bit as far as what we had as far you know with videos this week. So I'll bring up the chat on this end, and we'll bring up OBS. 
Oppo Ace 2 with 180 hertz. That's going to be an interesting uh, concept, mostly because the best that we can get is realistically 144. And um, I have the phone that has the 144, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, so I got a question here from Manish is, uh, do you know about the TV show called Tare Mehta Ka... No. <laughs> okay, so apparently there's a show that has the name Tarek in there, uh, which, which is an in this very famous buyer. I'll have to check that out. I'll have to check that out. Um, okay, so we do have a question here coming in for... Actually, somebody just purchased the NVIDIA Shield, and I also got the Kingston uh, micro SD card, the 512 gigabyte model. How good is the 512 gigabyte model? I'm also uh, desperately looking for the Shield Pro, but it's not available. At, well, any updates? So... Uh, overall, I think Kingston's been making really good memory cards. I, sh I showed actually a video of expanding the memory on the NVIDIA Shield and the NVIDIA Shield Pro. And honestly, if you don't game, and what I mean by gaming, meaning you need to basically run a server or you're trying to play NVIDIA Shield, uh, like basically the uh, the NVIDIA gaming experience that they have on their, on their Shield, I don't really think there's a big benefit in going into the Pro. You do basically, for the most part, obviously have... Uh, a little bit more as far as the internal storage, 16 gigs, not a lot, but you do have basically the ability of having the additional ports. Also, the fact that the form factor, because the NVIDIA Shield, the standard model, does not include any actual ports other than the XT card. So you have basically a more of a tube style, uh, and it's a little bit more concealed. It works roughly about the same. The controller, as far as the remote, works the exact same way. If you purchase a controller for it, it'll work the exact same. Um, but I think Kingston makes really good cards, and their new um, new line of cards are super fast. So when you're trying to basically load up 4K content, save videos, and do anything like that, you want to have the fastest storage possible. And I found that basically that the their Canvas Select Plus cards are doing the best uh, as far as, I'm not sure if that's the card that you picked up, but that's going to be the best uh, options on them, specifically for micro SD cards, because you're getting like 200 megabits read and write, which is the optimal uh, configuration if you're going to be loading 4K content on that as well. Um, so Firebug is asking, uh, would you recommend, obviously, the S10 Plus? Uh, honestly, yes. Yes, hands down. Uh, I think the S10 Plus, for me, will always hold a special spot from Samsung devices, mostly because of the fact that it is the last device that Samsung... And I'm, when I say it's device, I'm talking about the S line of devices, and I'm not referencing the S Lite or the Note Lite. Just keep those in mind. That still supported the 3.5 mm headphone jack. We had uh, a, a big display. We had support for the Gear, uh, Gear VR uh, system. That was also the last device that they had it there. Um, the processor, the 855, is still capable. It's still getting updates. It's going to be getting on, getting on an, uh, you know, One UI 2.0. It should still be able to carry you easy for another year or so. So I would not sweat about that. And I would definitely still say if you have the option to pick up the S10 Plus, um, I think on Amazon Renewed, you can actually get it. I got it one, the S10, as low as $399. And that was a few weeks ago, maybe about a month or so ago. So for me, I'd still recommend them, uh, hands down. They're definitely one of the best options if you like Samsung devices. And of course, you're getting the triple camera setup, the dual camera setups on the front with the S10 Plus, and of course, the QHD display. No high refresh rate, but still a really good experience for the price point in 2020. Um, if, yes. So you, Oh, you went for the 512. Okay. And it's the same kind. As long as you're getting the same kind, the, the Canvas Select Plus, uh, uh, Marisha, I think you're definitely going to be doing good. Um, Joker, Joker, what should I buy? The Note 9 with the Exynos processor or the Mate 20 Pro? That's a tough one. That's a tough one because they're definitely different devices. Uh, as far as the actual processor and the comparison, I think you're pretty much going to be in the same ballpark. Both of them are going to be running basically pretty fast processors. You'll have the obviously the uh, the Mate 20 Pro had that seven nanometer processor, which is a little bit better as far as more power efficiency. I have to say from using both, battery life on the Mate 20 Pro was definitely a lot better. I felt that the cameras were better. If you need a stylus, I think that would be probably the main thing shifting you into the uh, Mate, you know, obviously the Note 9. Uh, Google Play services are supported on both of those, so there's no issues there. And of course, you have EMUI desktop, and they're supposed to be getting EMUI 10.1 in the near future. So I think the Mate 20 Pro is still a very good contender if you're thinking about it, and if it supports the bands that are for you, meaning you're able to get 4G LTE in the market that you're in. Uh, nothing against the Note 9, but per se, if I had to compare the two and I've used both of them, I felt like the Mate 20 Pro did better. And um, overall, as an all-rounder, you had wireless charging, reverse wireless charging. That was one of the first ones that Huawei did to actually produce that as a, as a device. Um, so, oh, here's uh, William uh, William Eng. Uh, so, TK, can you, can you elaborate on the SD card you were using on the V60? Um, have you seen any improvement in the performance on the uh, over the V90 uh, using on the... V90 memory card. 
You mean the V30? I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about the V50 and the V60? Uh, oh, the UHS-2. So I am using the Kingston cards. That's the, I've been... So essentially, not that long ago, Kingston sent me a few cards uh, that basically they just like, hey, check them out, use them. And if you like them, you can talk about them. And I generally been using them for most of my devices. So I, I've been using it on my, uh, as, as I mentioned prior to that, with the NVIDIA Shield. And um, overall, the SD card itself works as, as the fast as possible. It works really well. It's rated to work faster than I feel like the reader and the writer um, on the LG V60 is, is set to work at. Um, the benchmarking applications that I've been using with it have been rating it at about 100, 100 or so, which is not the fastest that this SD card can support since I tested it on the PC. But I think the best thing you could do for 4K, uh, you know, for 4K content, uh, read and write and all of that stuff, get the best possible in the Canvas Select Plus. Uh, are providing us with the fastest read and write connections. And of course, once you connect it to your PC, you're getting even faster. So definitely one of the better options, uh, but it's the Kingston Canvas Select Plus micro SD cards. So that's the one I've been using with that one. Um, is the Mate 20 Pro have still screen? Uh, so I think in the initial batches, this is back to Joker Joker, the, um, the initial batches of the Mate 20 Pro did have some issues and I think those have been resolved. So if you're purchasing one that it was either A, new or B, was uh, basically manufactured or sold maybe about a month or so, two months, or maybe, I would say maybe early 2019, because I think that's when the Mate 20 was roughly uh, started to getting fixed with the displays. I think there was no issues at all. The unit that I had and I've had for a few years now, it definitely did not have any issues. And I think it's overall uh, kind of like a, a luck of the draw. So if you have the opportunity to picking it up new, at least you have the ability of, of basically checking it out and returning it. Uh, some stores, if you're purchasing them, uh, will actually validate that the display is definitely uh, at 100 percent. And they validate that there's no green hue on it and you should be OK. Uh, Aditya, hey, Sabaho, <laughs> Habib, uh, Tim Raid, hey, good morning, good morning. Uh, yes, so Marisha, I, I really feel like Kingston's been knocking it out of the park. I mean, I've been always a SanDisk fan for quite some time as far as SD cards. But then once I start seeing some of the main performance improvements that we've seen with a Kingston card, specifically Kingston, the Canvas uh, the Canvas Select, the Canvas Select Plus card, then that's those are the newer ones. Uh, they're doing really, really good. And I really wish I was able to get the 512 just to put it into my uh, NVIDIA Shield. But honestly, with 256 gigs, it, it takes a while before we're able to build up that long of a, that big of a library. Keeping in mind, though, that the NVIDIA Shield uh, does not support uh, basically uh, running Plex servers off of it. You need the Pro for that. So maybe that's some of the other reasons why you would want to get the pro um uh, we'll be back on why we are okay so joker joker has an interesting question so we'll talk a little bit more about that and we'll try to kind of jump into that one uh, and then we'll go from there um, so overall, I think as far as Google Play services and uh, Huawei made uh, GMS and HMS, those are the two main services that we're talking about. And he's wondering is, will we ever see basically, you know, where uh, Google Play service can come back to uh, Huawei devices? I think the process of getting them back on uh, in, a, in a just an over the air update kind of an update is a simple process. It's not that complicated because currently it's basically being forced out by default. They're normally that's how they've sold devices before. Um, is it something that can fix easy? Yes, it's a simple OTA update that inserts all the Google Play services into the actual uh, system. And at that point, everything gets basically set up correctly, but it has to be natively supported. So meaning Google needs to allow Huawei to be able to push that to their devices. In the current setup right now, till that situation gets resolved, it's a little bit hard to kind of call it out. Uh, they're basically starting to ramp up their Huawei, uh, basically their HMS uh, uh, ecosystem to basically get more developers to work with them. And then it, obviously, once it becomes big enough, it may not actually need to go back into Google Play services if they're able to tap into the same uh, resources and companies and application developers uh, that are providing those applications specifically for uh, Google Play service uh, type devices. Are we there yet? Not yet. Uh, it, it's going to be a long way, and mostly because of the existing uh, infrastructure. You have iOS for the apps for the App Store and the Google Play Store for Android, and those are going to be the major ones. And if we learned anything from the way at least Amazon's been operating, because Amazon has their own App Store and it's been around for quite some time, but it's still to date, even with Amazon's uh, basically demand and of course uh, market share, uh, still don't have the ability of actually getting it in there. So you don't get Google Play services there, and side loading some things actually is a little bit harder than normal so I personally recommend saying look 
uh, I think for me, it, there's a video that will be coming out this week talking about the Mate 40, uh, the sorry, the P40 Pro here. And I actually didn't load Google Play services. There's a process of doing it. I didn't actually load it. I wanted to see exactly how I would be able to do with a device that doesn't have Google Play services. Can I actually function with it? And I'll give you guys some of the information, some of the downfalls and shortfalls that I've been dealing with and what I've had to do to accommodate not having Google Play services natively built into this device. Uh, but I think just to kind of round up that question is it's going to have to be basically one once they fix the decision or once they decide that they're able to actually allow them. And once that decision is made, it's not that complicated of a process. Um, so let me just scroll up a little bit. I think I missed a few. What is the most affordable 5G phone for T-Mobile? Uh, actually, <laughs> that is a very nice one. Um, I pushed out an article this morning and this uh, on Monday, actually. Uh, it's going to be the TCL five, uh, TCL's 5G uh, mode uh, phone, uh, but I'm not sure if it's going to come out actually on in the U.S. right away. Uh, TCL announced three devices on Monday, officially announcing them. There's the 10, the 10L, sorry, the 10 Pro, the 10L, and the 10 5G. Now, the 10 5G is intended to be supportive of uh, TCL's uh, sub 500 uh, mark it's going to be released in europe but it should be able to support at least t-mobile's 5g which is the sub 6 5g uh, as i found that most european uh, 5g models are supporting it uh, and what you're getting there essentially is a sub 500 dollar 5g phone from tcl with a very nice display and overall i think the specifications that we're getting there are going to be basically very uh, mid-range device with a fast modem running the 765 uh, chipset from huawei sorry from uh, qualcomm that supports the x52 modem for 5g connectivity so i think that'll be a great option right now um let's look a little bit more here uh any ideas uh when the pro oh so as far as when the pro will be back i reached out to, to nvidia but i haven't heard anything back yet i'm assuming it's a manufacturing bottleneck at this point so obviously keep in mind um china's starting to pick up right now everything is opening up back so factories are starting to produce so i would say probably another month or so as long as um shipping shipping is not affected by all the the existing you know situation that's going on uh so good morning hey good morning joker uh do you have any uh, oh okay yeah so no i think i'm gonna okay so eight pro oh one plus eight pro versus lg v6 i'd be interested to check it out I, I honestly would like to be able to check it out i think the v6 is a beast of a device as far as productivity and and the quality of the content that you're able to produce with it and consume with it especially if you have the dual screen um option on it i think if you pick up the v60 you definitely want to pick that up um as far as spec wise, I mean, if we just like number wise, we just go straight numbers to numbers. Uh, the leaked information that we have today, and we'll actually, it's a good segue to jump into that. So let's go ahead and switch over on that side. And I'm going to we'll switch over to the external display. And we'll talk about that. So obviously, we all know the specifications of the V60. It's obviously running the 865 and, of course, the X55 modem. Uh, we uh, XDA published another article this week on the 9th of April talking about uh, basically some new information as far as matte frosted glass. Uh, we know, obviously, that there's going to be wireless charging, 30 watt uh, wireless charging from uh, from OnePlus. And the main benefit that is that we're looking at it here essentially is that it's first first option that we're getting we saw some new design cues and i think let's go ahead and play this quick video here uh let's see how the audio play so you need us you, you can see right there the design looks pretty much one plus centric and it just is just it's absolutely fantastic I, I i can't say good enough so we're seeing right there the new color options behold um some of the other options, obviously, here we'll, we're looking at, they, they posted some images, night shots from the OnePlus uh, 8 series. Uh, this is from the OnePlus 8 Pro, it seems like, actually. That's what Pete Lau is saying. And also, if you guys didn't catch it, they did an AMA yesterday over on Instagram, answering a lot of their uh, fan questions on there. Uh, but the main thing that we're looking at, obviously, here is the specifications are pretty much, if we just look at them straight on paper, um, both of these devices are going to be running the Snapdragon 865. That was no surprise. Sorry, there was no surprise there. Uh, Adreno 650, there's going to be 8 gigs and 12 gig models. So if we start looking at those comparison types, I'll say that obviously, you know, 8 is what we have currently on the V60. So there's going to be a comparable model, uh, but it definitely will go up to LPDDR5, it seems, not just the 4X um, on the OnePlus 8. Uh, sorry, the OnePlus 8. Uh, we have obviously 128 and 256 with no expandable storage. That's something that OnePlus hasn't done for quite some. Actually, I don't think OnePlus has ever done it. Uh, and then LG does give you the ability of expanding. So you're stuck to the the UFS storage, but it is UFS 3.0, uh, and of course no expandability. And LG does allow them to do that. 
Now, what we're looking at essentially here is the specifications for the battery. We're talking about the LG supporting a 5,000 milliamp battery, bigger than both of these devices, uh, where we have 4,500 on the 8 Pro. And of course, here where it gets a little bit interesting is that we actually have wireless charging for the first time. As I mentioned to you guys, uh, Warp Charge 30 Wireless. So that's the 30 watt uh, charger, similar to what we have with the Warp Charge 30T. Uh, now, and reverse wireless charging, which is something unique. So uh, if we compare this specifically, LG has a bigger battery and, of course, has the, fast, has the wireless charging, which is new. It, I don't think it does support 30 watt fast charging, but it does support uh, char wireless charging and, of course, quick charge uh, 4.0 from Qualcomm, uh, which gives us the ability of charging it from 0 to 100% in about an hour and almost 25, almost, or an hour and 30 minutes or so. No reverse wireless charging. So that's, again, a compensation there. There is a oh wow, quadruple camera setup on the Pro where um, LG went with three options. So there's the standard focal length, a wide angle lens, and the time of flight sensor. Uh, it seems like we're not going with the time of flight sensor here. We're going with a... A color filter that that's i'm i'm really hoping this is what we saw with that mclaren edition at ces again short answer uh, capabilities obviously 4k i i don't see 8k which is interesting that that's something that would be a nice edge for lg 8k at 24 frames per second very nice uh, front facing camera seems like a 1080p 30 which is also another plus for for lg if we look at it i think the front facing camera supports 4k 60 as well and then, then we can get into more of the specifications in there so um to answer that question, uh, I'm, I'm hoping I answered that question correctly. It, it seems like I think the LG device does have some pluses in one end and some, you know, the OnePlus has the other. Again, based on leaks, OnePlus can definitely blow all of that all out of the water. I mean, there are certain things we know that will be there, the, uh, the CPU and the X55 modem. Uh, the, 12 and, uh, the 8 and 12 gigs of RAM, that's something typical we've seen before. Um, as far as basically what we're looking at also is, you know, the type of technology, the display size. Uh, I think um, OnePlus will not support any kind of external displays, which this one does with the, with the optional case that you're able to pick up. Uh, even so, okay, let's just go back. I think I might have missed a few things here. Uh, what phone do you, uh, what phone you're using personally? Uh, right now I'm using the S20 Ultra as my primary phone. And then as a secondary phone is the Mi 10. Uh, but I'm also in the middle of kind of jumping between a few devices as part, as part of the process of reviewing them. So I alternate the, my secondary device to whatever the device is I'm, I'm reviewing. And then depending on what's going on with this crazy time, I may be doing that a little bit more often than I need to. But, uh, for the most part, I think I generally keep one as my primary, which is the S20 Ultra. Uh, TK OnePlus 8 series, uh, not going to be, yes, yes. I, uh, I, I, that comment that I saw from them saying that, you know, the, uh, the, you know, it'll be under a thousand is a little bit of a, an interesting concept. I mean, we, we've seen them increase their prices year over year, but I think what they've done it is they've never just increased it for the sake of increasing it. They've always increased the functionalities, the features, and given us some of the things that we've wanted from them. So we have to kind of comp kind of look at it this way. So we've wanted wireless charging from OnePlus for a long time. Uh, I Do I think all of their devices that are going to be released are going to be at a thousand bucks or nine ninety nine if they want to play that game kind of, kind of thing? I don't think so. I think the reality of the matter is going to be a spectrum of devices. We're going to have different options different configurations and obviously as we saw different colors so the goal is always going to be is uh, as we probably or we already know speed so they're focusing on speed and a lot of the specifications we just went through pretty much just scream speed um, they brought in wireless charging they brought in reverse wireless charging um, they brought in obviously the ability of having a higher refresh rate uh, and of course 120 hertz at a QHD display this is something that you know it, and this is obviously based on a tweet directly from OnePlus. So they're not hiding that. This is something that they're touting. So I think it's definitely going to demand a price. And I feel like if you're getting the super decked out version of the OnePlus at you know close to $1,000, I think it's well worth it. Uh, but it's, not, it's definitely not going to be the only option that always will be kind of like the highest model, which for the most part, not everybody will jump on. So I feel like I think we're okay. It is a little bit more probably, more than likely as again, every year they ever so slightly inch up. Uh, but I feel like they've they've done enough work to provide us that it's really smooth, really fast and dependable connection, uh, device that we've always wanted from them. Um, so, OK, so George is a basically a little bit conf confused. Uh, oh, mobile. Hey, George, how you doing, man? Um, I would say let's wait and see what happens on Tuesday. I think uh, it's a few days away. We're it's Saturday, like four more days, and then we'll have to see how how it goes. Um, 
so yeah, so an example right there, Gregory all uh, talking about his OnePlus 3T. And yeah, the OnePlus 3T is definitely one of the faster options on the market. It was right before they jumped from the 3 Series to the 5 Series because for some reason the 4 was not something that they were going to do. So I, I definitely a big, big fan. And uh, I still have a few family members that are using OnePlus 5s. So there's not there's no issue. OnePlus is dedicated to speed and with every update, that's what they're doing. So that's the main benefit of them. Uh, sorry, I mean, do you... Uh, do you do videos on IPTV services? No, no, actually, um, done anything and haven't been approached by anybody to do any kind of content there. Um, I, my primary, my primary presence online is on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram Live, um, well, Instagram Live, Instagram TV, um, and Amazon. So those are the main sources. And if you find or you see any of my content outside of any of those uh, mediums, uh, somebody's borrowing my stuff without talking to me about it. Um, I feel like the 7T is much better than the 8. So it depends on what you're looking for. And I would probably say I agree with you there, uh, at least from the specifications, what, what we've seen in that sheet that we saw there, the 7T and the, and the 8. Um, I think if you purchase the 7T or if you're in the market to purchase the 7T, I don't think the 8 is going to be the jump that you want to jump into. I feel like the 8 Pro would probably be more of a jump for you. Uh, the 7T literally just came out a few months ago, and I think in the US on T-Mobile, it's under 500 bucks. So under 500 bucks. Now, there's no 5G. Keep in mind, both of the 8 and the 8 Pro are supposed to be more of the 5G variant because the 865 is a built-in X55 modem. So we already know that part just for the factor of that the 865 will run the CPU. So the moment you have that, you're pretty much guaranteed having 5G. So it, if 5G is a factor, then the 8 will make sense. If it's not, I think the 7T is still a good buy. I think if you purchase the 7T right now at a good price, there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to get some of the latest and greatest features as long as they're not hardware dependent. And that's that's that little game that a lot of manufacturers will go through. Uh, you know, they bring in new features, but sometimes those features will require, obviously, uh, hardware dependency, which cannot be backwards down, you know, upgraded via software. Yes, the uh, the 7T is flat. It's a flat screen and people love that. So, yeah, if you're looking for a more of a flatter display, the 8T, well, no, not the 8T. I'm jumping on it. Uh, the 7T has that, uh, but I'm not sure about the 8. I haven't actually the seen. I think we've mostly seen a lot of designs and images of the 8 Pro. We haven't seen much about the 8, and but we are seeing, obviously, specs. Oh, man, Exposed Tuesdays. I... I've, I've, I've thought about it many, many times to try to bring back Exposed Tuesdays, and I, I have to really consider seeing basically the demand for something like that. So I'll, I'll run a poll on the channel and see how many people would love to see Exposed Tuesdays come back, because as a series, I think it was always definitely appreciated. And uh, for the viewers, if you guys are not familiar with Exposed Tuesdays, uh, Exposed Tuesdays uses, uh, it was basically a, a module featuring video once a week on Tuesdays, featuring a specific module that can improve or optimize our devices. Uh, keep in mind that these devices needed to be obviously rooted within a custom recovery and have exposed framework installed. Uh, so if you're familiar with it, you know what we're talking about. If you're not, it's something that I used to do on the channel. You can definitely Google it, TK Bay Exposed Tuesdays, and then you'll be able to see some of the older videos that I had there uh, here, but also as well as uh, some of the other channels that I used to work with or, or work with us at some point. Um, so Harun, uh, let me see here. Why? Okay, so this is the question from Harun. Uh, why most phones are uh, use uh, curved displays? They uh, they are all all of those features that took good promotional material. Da da da, and I see them in, in plus the benefit. I think the curved display is more of an aesthetic feel, right? It's the how it feels in. in, in I hate to say this. If Juan Carlos is watching this, he's going to cringe. So it depends on the feel in the hand and how you're holding it. Uh, for me, when you're holding a device with a sh with a flat display, there's nothing wrong with it. But when you're gripping it, you have that fat flat edge kind of going into your uh, your fingers. When you're holding a display that is symmetrical and it has a dual curve on the front and on the back, it just feels a little bit different. Obviously, all of that is out the door once you put a case on it. So I would definitely say, depending on what you're using it for, uh, I feel like the flat displays definitely have a better, uh, less, pr less prone to uh, accidental touches. I'll say that on the edges and initiating things on the right. Um, although I think Samsung has, uh, has, has definitely done a much better improvement this year by reducing that curve. So if, as we kind of mentioned the S10 Plus, that display had a very sharp curve, uh, meaning it was just a much longer, kind of dipped more to the sides. And with the S20, this, this time we have that uh, slightly of a small edge on the uh, curve, but it doesn't go all the way. So it really depends. Um, and of course, you can go with the Mi, Mi, the Mi Mix Ultra, which just basically wraps the display on the front and the back of the phone. So that that can go both ways, either super, super all the way or in the medium. 
Uh, but I, I still I, I hear you. I feel like there's definitely a market for flat displays. And if the 8 still comes with a flat display where the 8 Pro doesn't, at least you have a choice in the market when you're considering a OnePlus device in 2020. If you don't even want to go back to the 7T, which I feel like 7T is still a great option. Okay, uh, really looking forward to the next talk too. Have you seen any... Uh, Okay, so um, ben, Ma ben Mason is talking about the next talk. We did a video here not that long ago talking about the next talk too. Uh, now there is obviously uh, there's more content coming in. There's uh, there's also supposedly the next talk to touch that's supposed to be coming on uh, coming in later on in the middle of summer. Um, next talk too, I think is a very strong. Um, functional option and i love that you asked that question because i think it kind of segues straight into what i wanted to cover for you guys for this week uh so let's go ahead and make sure uh let me double check here yeah so let me just jump over onto the channel so uh, the next talk too is a functional uh, laptop case and shell of a laptop it doesn't have a cpu it doesn't have a gpu it has basically a built-in mhl adapter connected to a keyboard and mouse and basically a display in the in the shape of a laptop it looks like a laptop and when you connect it to your phone uh, depending on the phone that you're using if your phone supports screen mirroring like the oneplus devices or even you know lg samsung and other devices companies out there it's going to work perfectly pretty much the same you see your phone everything works the same with the exception is that you now have a keyboard and mouse interface directly into that phone um, where it gets very, very interesting, and let's go ahead and switch over to my external display, sorry, ran with the wrong camera here, is that when you actually want to be able to run it as an external, uh, actually a PC. So what we're talking about here is that this is, let me just jump over here real quick in the video. So this is a video that I posted on Monday, uh, and this one took me quite some time to actually get it running. Our PCs have, or at least our phones, Samsung phones, Huawei phones, as well as LG phones, and actually most Android phones, hopefully in the near future, support something called a desktop experience. And this is what we're looking at here. This is desktop experience called EMUI desktop that's built in directly into Samsung, sorry, this is Huawei phones. Now, if I skip a little bit further here, this is gonna be the Samsung DeX experience, which essentially is, again, a DeX experience on PC. It's a PC experience on our phones when we connect it. And the next doc invokes this automatically when you connect it. Um, let me switch over here. And then lastly, we have obviously is the desktop experience built into Android 10.0. Let's go ahead and switch over here. And Android 10 right now is not exactly as as developed. It's still an early beta, I would say early alpha stage, uh, but it is available and easily accessible on the V60, which is definitely a very big plus for me in, in any kind of functional way, uh, mostly because of what it offers us. And now that video is a little bit long, about 25 minutes, but if you're interested in learning more about what the what the desktop experiences that we currently have are, are giving us, uh, from the latest one on Huawei, the best one on uh, Samsung, as well as obviously Android 10, this is a great video to check out. I posted that one on Monday, um, and it's so far the, the response on that one has been very, very nice. Um, I will touch also real quick before we jump back into the questions is that I did post a video on Tuesday talking about uh, so I think it was a Tuesday or Wednesday about the Mi Mix 10. Now, this is the brand new device coming straight from Xiaomi, and it is the 5G. It's not the big brother, not the Mi, uh, not the Mi 10 Pro, but the, this is, and I did say mix, this is not the Xiaomi Mi Mix 10. It's the Xiaomi Mi 10 5G, uh, the, I would say, the, the younger brother of the Mi 10 Pro 5G. And uh, that video also did quite well. It was also a little bit long as I go through all of the different specifications. And then the last but not least, I did a video for you guys here talking about uh, the new update that we got to the one-handed operation function on one uh, on the Samsung devices within uh, GoodLock. And what I really love about it is that it actually enables you to actually reach the top of my phone with uh, with one hand. So what I'm talking about is this little function here. So hopefully I can show this to you guys. You can kind of see it right there, the mouse pad. Let's switch over here. And this mouse pad here becomes very functional because now I can actually reach things that I normally cannot reach without it. Uh, it sits on the side here. When I'm done with it, I can put it away and you can customize it as part of your shortcuts within the one-handed operation. Very nice, very functional. And that video came out literally about a couple of days ago. Let me go ahead and bring back the comment section. I think I may have missed a few. So let's go down. Uh, yeah, MIT talk about the Mi Mix Alpha. Samsung, uh, yeah. Definitely, they did fix it. Uh, so this is Harun uh, confirming, obviously, yeah, the, the, the edges and not so curved made them very, very good. Uh, so uh, Gregory all also confirms the, yeah, the OnePlus 70. I think it's a great option and a great price, especially at this time. Um, the stock for those things are available. Keep in mind, if you're thinking about getting this on a carrier, uh, so this is something that a lot of us, we need to kind of keep in mind and consider. Uh, we saw this last year when the OnePlus 7 Pro came out on T-Mobile. When the OnePlus 7T came out, the 7 Pro kind of was put aside. 
So just keep that in mind. Once the availability of the new 8 comes out, the stock as far as carrier version of these devices, it maybe will go down. But the other option that you always will have is the ability of going to swappa.com. And I have links for those in the description below. But it's a great site to be able to purchase uh, gently used devices that have been verified from sellers that you can trust. And um, this is not a sponsored thing from Swappa. I personally use them all the time. That's how I buy and sell devices quite a bit, especially if I'm buying them used. Um, and I did that actually with the uh, Galaxy Fold. Uh, I bought that earlier this year and I sold that when I was done, as well as the Z Flip. So those are the things that I generally do to be able to keep the consistent flow of devices running on the channel. Um, I may lose a little bit of money, but it, at least it gets the benefit of everybody experiencing how things are. So let's go back here. Uh, so Chrome, yes. Uh, do you think Google will support <laughs> Chrome on the uh, on a Pixel device? I had that question come up actually in the comments for that video, and I was kind of surprised. Uh, actually, I do agree. I, I feel like Google has two different teams. Obviously, you have the Google Chrome team, and then you have the Android team. And I feel like Android is trying to build up an ecosystem as a desktop experience where we, for the most part, already kind of have that. I mean, we have Chrome OS. Chrome OS is something that has already been developed for many, many years. Not only that, Chrome OS supports Android applications and even the Google Play Store. So. You have that kind of one-way integration where Chrome OS integrates some of the Android applications in there, but why don't we have it the other way where we have Chrome loading on Android devices? And I think that I think that what may end up being the situation is that at some point or another, somebody will basically click the two or like an idea with a little light bulb kind of comes on and they'll be like, wait a minute, can't we just put Chrome in here? And I really would love to see that. Um, First and foremost, though, they would definitely need to be able to enable MHL support. Most of the Pixel devices on the market right now do not support that, and it has been disabled by design. So at this point, I feel like Google is not ready for this, and that's why we're seeing uh, demonstrations or like where we're able to see desktop experiences on LG devices, where we're able to see this on OnePlus devices. Uh, and we obviously need to force it on the OnePlus where LG has it on by default. Uh, but that's because Google doesn't feel like, you know, Android 10.0 desktop is, is ready yet for main consumption. So I would say this at this point. Um, my hope is that, yes, they would bring in Chrome OS over on Android devices. And I think that's the smart move. Um, and even better, I would love it to see it on Chrome uh, Chromecasts, obviously. It's already there. It's connected. And I would not I would imagine a small bro bare bones set, uh, setup of that with Bluetooth connectivity would make the Chromecast so much more functional as an easy kind of Fire Stick competitor, a true Fire Stick competitor, as opposed to just a, uh, a casting type of device. Although for about 35 bucks, I think at the lower end model or even 50 bucks, I think they're definitely the best option. And you can also even get the Chromecast Ultra if you're jumping into Google Stadia, which is a whole different conversation for a different episode. <laughs> Uh, let's jump in real quick back into the comments. Um, there's already there was already a mouse pad uh, provided in the Note 4. Not as good, but similar. Actually, there's another application even on the market, a touchpad, uh, that was a touchpad application that was giving us the same functionality. Uh, what I like about this, and it, the really reason why I was excited about it, it's the integration of how it launches. Uh, the way it works right now, it's actually integrated to the gesture functionality that we get from One Hand Operation Plus. So when you use those, and for me with long devices, the S20 Ultra is a massive device. And not only that, um, in the video, I kind of also showed that it works on the S20. And the S20 is a 6.2 inch display. So we're we're not talking small devices. Uh, we can't reach the device uh, to the top all the way with one finger anymore. I mean, anytime when we cross the five inch display, which was a long time ago, it's hard. And I feel like the integration with the gesture makes it a little bit more functional. And also, I feel like with it being integrated into one-handed operation, uh, we'll be able to actually see it updated more realistically and more frequently than some of the other app apps that I've seen, where they generally will not get the support as much as they like. Uh, this also opens it up to many, many Galaxy S line of devices and Note line of devices very easily by just installing GoodLock. Uh, my thing would be is I wish they would install the launcher, which is the GoodLock app by itself without any of the modules natively into Samsung devices without actually telling it. I mean, they, in they include so much more things that may be considered as bloatware or even things that you don't want to install. But their own application of GoodLock, you'd have to actually know about it to get it. And that to me is a little bit like... You should have that in there. Don't activate any of it, but just include it. So Samsung, if you're watching this, please, 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 from now on, include good luck, uh, good luck in all of your devices. Uh, so there is no repair or service uh, service center in Singapore for OnePlus phones and even more OnePlus 8 Pro. Um, <laughs> Yeah, even if the OnePlus Pro, that's going to be a problem. So there is a yeah, the, actually OnePlus centers are, are are expanding, and I'm hoping they'll keep doing that and see more and more countries. 
but yeah, it's not that that's not the the main. The, it's pretty much a, a very similar situation in the Middle East. They don't have a big big presence in there, but there's a lot of fan base there. So a lot of people love their devices. But having a service center that's close to you makes it a little bit better as far specifically with warranted uh, repair. Because if something happens to your device and that's your only phone, it's hard to separate from it for a long time if you have to ship it somewhere else. So I, I totally agree with you. Um, in the last update for OneRI 2.9, will it be coming to Android to Note 9? So my understanding is that Note 9 should be able to receive it. The Note 9 is only two years old. So if you think about it, this will be basically the biggest hurrah thing that they kind of get, get you. So 2.1 should be coming. Uh, I don't think all of the features of 2.1 that are hardware dependent will come down. So those things you have to kind of keep in mind. Single shot for some reason hasn't been translated out, but I'm hoping that that will come down because that's mostly a software thing. But anything that's specific to the S20 line of devices like the Super Zoom and all of those things that came with 2.1 will be pretty much locked into what you have in there. Um, they could push that. Uh, yeah, they can definitely do that as an OTA. There's no question about that. Uh, <laughs> definitely. So uh, the other thing I definitely want to talk to you guys about. Uh, so let's let's switch over real quick to the overhand, and I want to show you guys real quick what the Mi Mix Ultra. Uh, sorry, the Mi. I keep calling it a Mi Mix Ultra, the Mi 10 5G. So the Mi 10 5G brought me in a lot of surprises this year. So let's go ahead and unlock. I guess I forgot to. So the Mi. It's running uh, the Mi UI 10, uh, Mi UI 11. Well, it's yeah, Mi UI 11 over Android 10.0, and as you can see, it's in a, this is the European model version of this device. Now, I do want to mention that in the unboxing video that I posted, I did say that it does not have 5G. But I want to say honestly that every once in a while, I see the 5G logo come up depending on the bands that it supports. Um, I currently only have T-Mobile 5G in the US. I don't have an AT&T 5G. I do have an AT&T SIM, but not an AT&T 5G account. AT&T in the US did it a little bit differently as they typically do. Um, you have to have a, a special SIM that is uh, 5G uh, compliant, but not only that, you also have to add 5G as a service, which increases the price of the plan uh, to be able to use 5G. So uh, if you're looking for something that is very competitive as far as price uh, for 5G, I feel like T-Mobile still does it the best. Uh, but again, so every once in a while, I do see 5G, but the 4G LTE connectivity here works very, very nicely. Uh, I've been gaming on this, using this device. I'm kind of building up my experience as far as the review that should be coming out hopefully in the next week or so. Um, this supports wireless charging, reverse wireless charging, but also a 108 megapixel sensor on the back, uh, a wide angle lens. And of course, we have a micro, uh, macro lens and then basically a depth sensor. Uh, last but not least, a dual tone LED flash and a front facing camera here, obviously giving us the best experience. Let me go ahead and clear those notifications. So many notifications. Um, but what I really like about the fact is that the UI that we get here from uh, Xiaomi uh, is very, very strong. So let's go ahead and clear all those notifications. Uh, and what you're getting here is a very good, I'm not saying a stock experience, but it's definitely a very nice customizations, dark mode. Uh, it's pretty fast. We also have uh, basically the ability of getting different models. Now, the, US, the EU model, the European model, would be a single SIM model. But one of the really cool things about this, if you notice, there's a grill sitting at the top and another one at the bottom. It's because we actually have true wireless speakers on this device. That's something that's very unique to uh, the last time I saw this was on the Mate X, the Mate 20X. That was the biggest version of the Mate 20 line of devices. Uh, and that one included stereo speakers. And this one does the same thing. And it works really good. We have an IR blaster, a 90 hertz refresh rate display, very good specifications and great cameras that will basically give you the, a really good experience. So for me, um, I like it. I look really, I'm looking forward to basically finishing up the review for you guys and talking a little bit more about that. Uh, the P40 device, again, still using it. Uh, what I want to share here real quick, let's jump in. Uh, yeah, just doing some updates here. Uh, still runs very, very nicely. Again, I have not installed Google Play services. I am using the email application for my email. I've depended quite a bit on the Aurora store, and that's basically part of the F Droid. So let's go ahead and see. I'm updating uh, the uh, WhatsApp. Uh, and this actually fixed 90% of my dependency on the Google Play Store uh, or actually needing the Google Play Store to install. Uh, everything still runs the same. We have the app drawer. The refresh rate is crazy. Gaming on this is just absolutely fantastic. On the left, we have that little nice today tab. But again, uh, so no Google services, no way of initiating the assistant. Uh, and those are things you have to kind of get used to. Uh, using Google services or applications for me has been basically just uh, dependent here on web apps. So you notice right there, I did install Chrome. That's because I'm able to download it through using the, the, the actual uh, Aurora store. And surprisingly enough, Chrome does not need GMS to run. Uh, YouTube and Maps both are web apps based on Chrome, so it's very easy for me to launch and I'm able to use them. And the interface is very simple. You could see it loads it up. It works pretty much the same. And of course, I can go back home, check out all the feeds, log in with my account, and it works just the way you would expect it. So 
that video should be coming out very, very soon. And again, as I said, on Monday, I pushed out the video that talked about not this guy, but these three guys and what you get essentially the comparison between DeX on uh, the Samsung devices. And of course, what we have EMUI desktop and the, des the desktop experience with Android 10 here on the V60 ThinQ. Let's go ahead and switch over back here. Check out some comments as I switch over to the next next thing we want to talk about. Let me let me drag the comments back. Wait, where is that window? Here we are. So okay, so we got some more comments. Let's let's go ahead and check. Could could Samsung launch the Galaxy Fold 2 at at the Z Flip's pricing? Wow, would be a, a big shot a big shot for Samsung as opposed to being twenty seven hundred dollars, which is what we've seen, uh, which is what we're kind of seeing right now. So William Ong is talking about the. Samsung's already kind of released the S line of devices, so we kind of already know that the S20, S20 Ultra, S20 Plus, and the the as the Z Flip came out basically right before. Well, they were announced at the same time, but the Z Flip came out to the market before those. Short answer: There's two more major devices that we're looking from. Obviously, this is away from all all the A line of devices and all of the S line of devices are going to be the light models. Uh, I'm anticipating them having the S20 Lite and the uh, Note 10, uh, Note 20 Lite, but again, different market. Um, the Fold 2 and the Note 20 is going to be the biggest things coming up, and hopefully the Note 20 Plus and Ultra. I'm not sure how they're going to go with the names. Um, I think it would behoove uh, Samsung to basically start thinking about their price point and their strategy. Uh, I don't think Samsung's trying to make this device as popular as the other devices that they sell. This is a very unique experience, a very unique device structure that requires that not everybody purchases it because, and I'm just going to be frank about the situation is, um, it's not, I don't think they mean for everybody to have it. I think it's part of their design that when you, there's a few things you can do from a manufacturing standpoint to um, control how your device is used. You can basically make it super affordable. Everybody can get it, or you can make it basically super delicate, which is what those devices are. And don't forget that the Z Flip is still a very delicate device. I know it's a, a year later or roughly a year later from the original announcement of the Fold, but it really was a few months after the Fold came out. And it still has very much a very sensitive display, even though it technically has small particles of glass in there and you need to install a, 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 a screen protector. Because in the few weeks that I did have my Z Flip, it still had some um, basically, uh, I would say basically uh, hairline scratches on the display. It's not deep, but it was actually generated from my finger, which is weird. Uh, so for me, I feel like if they're coming out with the Fold 2 and they do fix that display, the price point is going to have to justify it because they sold the first one with the, ma with the massive display issue at 2000 uh, bucks. The Z Flip came out with the same type of display at about 1400 bucks. If they can go in between, I think that's the smart point, basically giving us generation two, better improvements and slightly better price. And I think more people will go for it, but chances are they're probably gonna keep the price point and may even go higher than the first one. That's just the prediction. Again, if we see what the other foldable um, companies are putting out, like let's say the Mate X, uh, that's something that, again, 2,400 bucks for a device, is, it is bigger, but that's how the market has been doing. It's the demand. And I think they mean for it to be a limited kind of access type of device till it becomes more durable. Because I feel like uh, there is going to be that situation where somebody buys it and if it wasn't, you know, obviously in a certain price point, and they could damage it, then Samsung will be inundated with like replacements and so on. So for them, it's still an experiment. I think it's an experiment that they're just allowing us to buy things from them with it. But keep that in mind. I think that's the best way to look at it at this point. Uh, let me scroll down a little bit further down. Da, da, da. Yes, definitely on the OTA. Something to do with the, the way the, the, the comment system here in YouTube. Uh, if I don't touch it for some time, it kind of goes back up, which is weird. Oh, the Black Shark 5G. So I do want to mention that I did actually get reached. The company, one of the PR companies that works with Black Shark reached out to me regarding the Black Shark. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to pan out. I, I kind of trying to still work with them, but they, they're literally, they get back to me once a week. So I think it's a situation with the way things are back in China and so on, how it's going. So I'm hoping I'll be able to get the Black Shark. And if I do, I'll definitely be providing you guys some update on that. I don't have access to that. Uh, I'm still finishing up my review. Uh, look forward to a video on this tomorrow gaming experience. 144 hertz gaming experience on the 5G, uh, on the Red Magic 5G. With the full review coming out hopefully in about a week. Um, so yeah, EMU, uh, May 10, EMU, uh, ah. I think there was a so um monster abul uh, abul am abul anan alan habib um i i if i and i could be wrong please don't quote me on this unless unless you 
seen it as well. I think I saw somewhere where there was a comment. Initially, they they rejected or they said or Huawei said that they were not going to be pushing EMUI 10.0 for the uh, for basically the Mate 10. So the Mate 10 obviously is uh, the predecessor of the Mate 20. Uh, there was no basically it went Mate 10, Mate 20, and then obviously Mate 30. And now, well, next year will be Mate 40. Well, not next year. Later this year, we'll see the Mate 40. Um, there, there's a slight possibility that they could actually do that. I, I've seen them kind of go both ways. At the end of the day, it depends on the manufacturer is uh, basically willing to support it. It may be end up it, that's the last update that you get. So Android 10.0 for the Mate 10. Um, I also feel like the Mate 10 did have a much better support from a developer community, which you were able to basically unlock it and start installing custom ROMs. So there was always that option there. There was not a lot of custom hardware in there that um, the cust uh, custom ROMs wouldn't provide you with a much better experience, like an Android 10, like a Lineage OS or something like that. So if you're not modded or rooted on that device, I would recommend you uh, just hold up a little bit more. I'm hoping they do actually do come through on that uh, and they change their mind and they provide the update. So that would be very, very nice because it was definitely one of my really favorite devices when i first saw it because just the fact that the massive display the cameras on this the ui and it stayed fast for a long long time which is definitely very nice um do you have any idea when the note 20 would be, would be released more than likely september samsung actually has confirmed that their timeline is not changing for the rest of the year so there's going to be basically end of august september so it'll basically be announced mid-august and then available september uh the way we've had note line of devices for many years so if you're holding up for the note 20 that's uh, that's definitely when you're going to be looking into it um do you oh did you see a device called the castaway a uh, second screen for phones no, I actually haven't seen that one. Um, I've I, the name Castaway comes to mind as an application that I used to uh, that I reviewed a long time ago, but I haven't seen that as a second one. Actually, I take that back. I'm not sure if you're talking about the one that was uh, there was there was a display that I saw at CES that was intended to be basically a second display for your phone, and the second display ran Chrome OS. So it was Chrome OS running on a second display connected via Bluetooth and Wi-Fi to your main device and giving you access to it. And I'm not sure if that's the device. I, I could be wrong on the name. Again, I haven't heard about it for months now, but I did see something very similar to that, and it was made specifically to run in conjunction with a smartphone. And essentially, it's running a uh, basically a small version of Chrome, Chrome OS, Chromium, on a second display connected to your device. So definitely a really exciting part if that happens. Uh, Dr. Donna, hey, Dr. Donna, welcome back. The V60, uh, will it need, uh, sorry, will it need an, uh, a screen protector? And I think I saw where the case would not, oh, interesting. So I'm not sure if, as far as the screen protectors, it depends on what you're going. If you're going with glass protectors, I don't see a reason why the case wouldn't close. Uh, let me just go ahead and put the phone back in and I'll explain to you guys what I mean. Uh, the, the display itself, it always has a somewhat of a gap in there. It never actually shuts all the way down. So if you're going to be putting in a glass protector on your device or a protector, I think it's always recommended. It's always going to be the situation. Let's switch over to the top display here. And let me switch this so I can actually see what I'm doing. So when you guys see right there, so here's the device. And it kind of looks like they're shutting on each other, but you see it right there. See, it never actually closes all the way. So even even with without a screen protector, which is what I don't have right here. So what you're looking at essentially is if you add a glass protector, it may be a little bit opening like this, but you're protecting the display. And the good thing about it is it's the same protector for both displays. I, I recommend you getting a display protector always, uh, mostly because it provides the protection that you want. Let me double check here. Uh, the phone... Oh, this phone has issues. The V60 uh, will need to be taken. Screen protector allowed a case to close. Yeah. Um, it, it really depends. You can also go with the non-glass protectors, which are generally a little bit thinner, and that should be a little bit better as far as glass protectors. Uh, the main difference, obviously, is if how are you using your device. If it's in the case all the time, it's closed. The, the, the displays are protected all the time. There's not that much of an issue there. I don't see it as a big issue for you to necessarily say that you need to switch to get a glass protector. If you're using it by itself with a case, like the way I've been doing it for the last couple of days, I think it's not a problem, and I think it should be pretty easy to put in a glass protector without any problems there. Uh, let's go ahead and go through a little bit more here. How do you like the autofocusing on the S20 Ultra? <sighs> How do I like it? Okay, um... So this is Gregory Hall. Uh, all uh, I'm gonna say this: the I have I have the unlocked model of the S20 Ultra. I don't have a carrier version because the, there was a little bit of a pricing situation with whole getting getting it on T-Mobile the way I normally get them. Um, and for that, I'll take a little sip. And the short answer on this is it's it's 
it's not i would <laughs> it's not the it's not the worst it's not the best it needs help um Samsung's using obviously the the 108 megapixel sensor. That's a big sensor, and uh, the focal length and the actual sharpness of the actual focal length is so hard. And what I mean by this is like if you move not even barely a centimeter or like not even a millimeter away from where you are, the subject that you're working with, it the device has to basically refocus to catch it. So. My understanding is that there's a few camera updates that are coming up that will help Samsung's uh, basically implementation of the sensor in here and ha give us better autofocusing. Uh, for me, the way I've basically worked with it for the last, you know, for about a month or so now, uh, is basically just making sure that my subject is dead center and as much as close as possible to the sensor. So if I'm taking a picture of my son, my wife, or anybody like that, I make sure that it's centered. It's not off centered so that it works much better. But there's also the fix of just doing touch to focus. A lot of people are using autofocus, um, which is great. But if you know where your subject is and you want, you know where you want to basically or how do you want to compose your image, I feel like the touch to focus will fix most of those concerns. And my hope obviously is that Samsung will definitely update a software so that the autofocusing functionality uh, mirrors to what we, you know, the things that we expect from them on the S10 line of devices or even on the Note 10. Super sharp, super fast, uh, basically autofocusing. But again, first time they're using such a large sensor and even the S20 and the S20 Plus don't show, don't have that same uh, sensor. So there's always going to be that challenge over there. Um, Oliver is asking, are you able to buy the LG V60 from AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile, and then unlock it uh, to, to use on any other network? Um, technically, yes. Can you buy it? Yes. Uh, what happens essentially if you're purchasing it from a carrier, uh, you can't buy it outright. Uh, or if you do buy it outright, uh, they're not going to allow you to unlock it without being a customer on them. So carriers are basically, so simple way, if you want to do what you're asking, You'd have to be a customer for one of these three carriers, buy the phone from them, and then get it unlocked. And that's the only way to get this done. The other way to do this, which is the other process a lot of people do, go to swappa.com, S-W-A-P-P-A.com. There's a link for that in the description below. And look for the LG V60. And you more than likely will find that this is a carrier version of the LG V60 that the people purchased from them. And then they unlocked it to be sold for other people to use. So what you're trying to do is pretty much done for you. And more than likely, you'll get it for the better price than buying it brand new. So if that's what you're considering right there, um, Oliver, I would definitely recommend you doing that through Swappa. Uh, as if you try to buy it directly from the carrier and you're not a customer of their it's not going to happen. They're not going to let you do it. Uh, more, more than likely, most of them will not even let you buy it straight. You'd have to actually go through a third-party reseller that may end up letting you buy it without a contract. There's the whole subsidy and naming thing. So I think Swappa would be the best deal, and you'll be able to get your V60 much, much faster. Uh, there's no word about an unlocked model of that yet, so that's still kind of a toss-up as far as when that happens. Uh, yeah, definitely. Max Lee hopes to get uh, gets the updated as well. Yeah, no, I, I saw Max's comment uh, as well. Yeah, Usui eight, <laughs> and thank you, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, very tricky to do that. It is. It's a little bit harder to kind of figure it out, but you have to just make sure you follow exactly how to get the autofocusing done correctly. And I feel like that's the main challenge. It's just. It's beautiful when it works and when it catches that focus, but autofocusing is tricky. But I think again, just touch to focus should be able to fix most of your problem. Yeah, so um, Aaron uh, Fritz, uh, hopefully I'm saying the name correctly. So uh, I've reviewed tablets and I'm actually in the process of getting a new one. Um, I haven't done review tablet reviews for about a year now, mostly, well, actually, I take that back. I, I've reviewed the media pads from Huawei. Um, those are generally inexpensive tablets running basically, obviously, the uh, uh, silicon, uh, the uh, Kirin chipsets. Um, and those have been the main, mainly the ones I've reviewed on the channel. I've done some reviews for Samsung ones as well as Motorola ones and, and an Asus one. Um, and of course, I've done some as well. Actually, I take that back. Now that I'm talking about it, I did actually even do one from Alcatel uh, here in the U.S. So there is quite a few videos on tablets on the channel. I don't know why I kind of spaced out on that one. Um, next one, we have Gergeol. Uh, can you finance it through the factory? Uh, if you're purchasing it directly from a carrier... Uh, from Samsung, yes. Samsung obviously uh, supports their own financing. T-Mobile supports their financing. Uh, all major stores, even Amazon and Best Buy will support financing. So they have their options as you're checking out through the process. Uh, but I'm not sure if Swappa does that. That's a different situation. I think Swappa, you're pretty much buying it straight um, unless you have a way. Uh, actually, I take that back. You can pay Swappa with PayPal and PayPal will do the financing for you. So if you if you use PayPal as a payment method, you can definitely finance it even through Swappa. Uh, 
Yeah, it's it's evening. Well, it depends on the time. You're right. Evening for some people, morning for some, and lunch for some other people. Um, so thank you so much for looking at the LV60, but it's, it's hard to get any unique phones uh, here in Sweden. It's a little bit hard. It is very hard, and especially because at least with the V60 that we've seen right now, um, the v, uh, the G9 the G9 will not be pretty much a one to one comparison. There was some rumors at some point from what we saw where we saw that the G9 was going to be a V60 rebranded for international markets, but it seems like it's going to be the other way around. The G9 is going to be slightly underpowered, running a more of a seven series uh, chipset from Snapdragon as opposed to the 865. So something something to do. I'm not sure what they meant there. Uh, and then after that. Uh, where are we in the discussion now? The leaks, the X, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, actually, we're in the Q and A section, which ninety percent of the time that kind of goes through. So we will jump into the actual uh, situation. So we did cover the leaks on the OnePlus. We talked about the fact that obviously we've seen uh, the new updates as far as the design, the colors. Uh, we saw the video that was just posted. Obviously, we know that there's the 120 hertz display, uh, the functionalities that we get there, and then we did a quick comparison with the V60 conversations, uh, and we also did talk a little bit about EMUI. So this is literally the uh, meat, the meat and potatoes of the actual. Uh, uh, live stream, which is generally the Q and A's. I feel like I always enjoy those the most as it kind of just makes it so cool and so fast. Um, so Dr. Donna talked about, I've heard about the TCL and is releasing these phones this summer. What have you heard of that on that? So back in January uh, at CES, I had a chance, to, I, I posted a video about that and I think it was in my tweet. Uh, but if you if you just search uh, TCL TK Bay, uh, I think TCL TK Bay CES 2020, uh, you'll see the video that I did there. Uh, the devices are actually very nice. Uh, they're large displays. Um, the 10L and the 10 5G are IPS uh, panels, and the 10 Pro is an OLED panel. It's the first OLED panel that they're coming up from TCL. Uh, and those devices are going to be sub $500, great price point. Um, they're not going to be running the latest spec, so don't expect an 865. It's more of the 765, the 7 series of ch uh, chipset. Uh, the 5G model, which is uh, will support the, the 5G model on the 765, and the other ones are going to be basically 4G LTE. Um, I think they're great options. They're they're supposed to basically be good as far as you know contenders from processor, storage, and functionality, and the display looked really, really nice. I didn't get a chance to play with the camera, so I can't really speak on that behalf, but my hope essentially is that uh, if what we see on paper is true, is that they'll translate to basically good cameras. Are they going to be great? I don't know. We'll have to have to, uh, some more time there. I did reach out to TCL, and I'm hoping uh, they will consider me to be part of their review process. So uh, I'm hoping that how, that's how it goes. But again, I saw them at CES. I uh, didn't get a chance to play with the cameras, though, so I can't speak more than that. Um, so Aaron Fitz, seeing that the S20, okay, so this is, uh, so one of you guys is answering, uh, note 10 live there. Okay. So the V60 wasn't even released in South Korea. That is a very, that is very interesting. I'm, I'm surprised that LG wouldn't release their own phone in their own market. So it's a very interesting, the V60 is having a very interesting, so it, it, it just more of a reference for you guys. In the U.S., at least within the last year or so, LG stopped being pre stopped having presence in physical stores. And what I mean by this, if you go to a carrier phone like T-Mobile, Verizon, AT&T, you couldn't see an LG phone on the shelf. You wouldn't be able to even try it out to know how it works. What the LG V60 is supposed to do this year is they're bringing them back onto the shelf. Obviously, when the stores open up again or all the stores open up. So my goal, obviously, is to provide you guys as best information on it as possible. I think it's a great option for from an LG device. It's a big phone. There's no question about it. There's no way of going around it. It's a massive phone. Adding it to the case makes it even bigger. But when you get what you get with that is a great gaming experience. You get a great audio experience with the fact that we still have the headphone jack. And on top of that, you're getting Android 10.0, desktop experience, great cameras, 4K, 60, 8K, all of the stuff that you want, and it starts at $799 without the case on T-Mobile and $899 with the case. So you can't really go against that. And, uh, oh, <laughs> Salam, Salam. Uh, Mimin, uh, Mimin Ran Glot, hopefully I'm a Ahlan, Ahlan. Um, Ahlan. So, oh, Aditya, of course. <laughs> Meats and potatoes, the meats and potatoes. You like that one, huh? <laughs> Steve, hey, Steve DeRoche, ah, Ahlan, Salam, Salam, Ahlan. Oh, all the cool guys. So, uh, yeah, so uh, have you heard anything about Xiaomi, uh, the Mi A4 or any Android One Xiaomi? Haven't heard much on the Xiaomi front uh, other than the Mi 10 lately. And uh, obviously, we'll, we'll be seeing more about the Android One initiative. I think it's a little bit early in the year and most companies are still trying to figure out what to do as far as launches. A lot of people are 
at home. A lot of people are not able to basically go out and check out these devices. So my hope is that Xiaomi focuses on providing people options, especially medium and mid-range devices. Android One is a great option of uh, basically any kind of devices. I think Motorola did a really good job putting that in. Um, we would love to obviously see more LG type of devices to run that as well, because I feel like Android One just makes it very simple. If you get the almost stock experience of Android on, on pretty decent hardware, generally they do tweak that. Uh, but I would love to be able to see some more with Xiaomi, especially on the mid-range, because I think you probably already noticed that the Mi line of devices are starting to go up on price a little bit. Um, stream. Oh, let me double check. Did it actually die? Uh, I hope I didn't. Let me double check here. So I, oops, jump back, go back here. Oh, the quality of the stream is red. No, 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 no. Okay, let me see. Let me see what's going on here. And it went offline. Okay, we'll give it a second. Give it a second here. Okay. Oh, man. The stream is definitely having a lot of problems and I'm not sure if it's my Wi-Fi connection or... Oh, man. I um, yeah, yeah, I can't I can't really speak to the quality of the video and I do oh man. The stream is definitely acting very, very hard. Problem is I can't stop it, and if I stop it, it won't go back. And I wish I had a way of changing the quality. Don't know why, do not know why, guys. I wish there was a way to troubleshoot it. The only thing I can do is literally um, shut it down and I would have to literally shut it down and start it over again. So let me see here, maybe let me close this channel so that we don't have anything running there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the actual live stream here. Close this guy and let, let's see here. So I, I know my, my live stream going out is working fine. So let's close this channel. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, this is where it's super low and it's bad. There's no question about it, and it's super stuttery. Uh, let's let's jump back into the comments and see where we. Let me see, does it actually get better? Ah, <laughs> oh, dang it, YouTube. No question.
not only did I fall out of focus, okay, a whole bunch.